Tripp's on. We got Linda Gordon on. All right, hold on. Linda Let's G. Linda G. Wait. Isn't that a rapper? Something G? Shh. And we are live on Facebook. We, we are, are live. live. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back. I am your host, Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg, together, as always, with Rabbi Philip Moskowitz, Rabbi Josh Brody, and we are here to take you behind, behind the, the Biba. Welcome back to another great night. We have a very special guest coming on so shortly. We've got an incredible sponsor tonight. We've got a lot of topics to follow through on, follow up on from last time. People are still talking about. Uh, but of course, the first thing we do is say l'chaim, another week of good health and happiness, of joy and celebration. Please, God, we're on the cusp of a wonderful holiday. We're going to receive the Torah. We're going to the mountain together, and we're going to start anew. It's super exciting. Rabbi Brody has exciting news to share in a moment about that. So to all of our, uh, to all of our friends watching, we say l'chaim. Baruch atah Adonai. L'chaim, l'chaim. Amen. Hey, Robert, Brody, what's, your, what's your big news? I've been celebrating. Yeah, I didn't, first of all, I don't know about this big news. This, big this news. is new to me. It's breaking news. Now, I don't think any, any of you could say the same thing, but tonight, for the first time in my life, I just finished counting the entire 49 days, man. Woo! 49, all Amazing. 49. Amazing. If we, if we had sound effects, we would make them go right now. <laughs> and uh, to you, we say l'chaim. You should have saved that last count. Should have saved the last count. I should have saved it for the show. I know. Yeah, you should have saved it for the what, show. What okay. made this year different, Rabbi Brody? What allowed you, you to it, it persevere? It was the fact that every night, Simone and Eliana, we got together. We just counted every night. Like no one, even if we got, you know, it was late or something, we might have missed it. Like, don't forget, Ayala had bought uh, Eliana a... Uh, uh, a pillowcase and it had all 49 days on it and every night she has a marker that she checks off the day so i'll tell you there's almost no excuse not to make it these days you got alerts you got reminders you got whatsapps you got apps you got texts no, i'll tell you what all. gets they you no, no 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 friday night plag mincha is what gets you friday night's yeah, a killer. always one friday night could be a killer there's no question and i will tell you this because it's relevant to the discussion we ended with last week which was yesterday was our first day back on the shul campus, outdoors, socially distanced, wearing masks. We'll talk all about how we did that in a moment. But I texted Rabbi Moskowitz right afterwards. We were at two separate minyanim. I said, in the middle of Marav, did you panic? So what do you mean, about what? I said, in the middle of Marav, I realized that for the first time in six and a half weeks, for the first time, I was going to have to count Sphira out loud. And what I took as a luxury all this time, not having to do that. Of course, all of a sudden, my what night is it? I know where I was at the end. If I calculated backwards or forwards based on it was just Rosh Chodesh. And there went that whole Shemona Esrei of Marav out the window. So we're back to the anxiety of uh, rabbis. <laughs> it's back. It's back. Uh, let's talk about our sponsors for a moment. Uh, they're watching actually with us and it's uh, so good to have them uh, tonight's sponsorship. All of our sponsors have been dear friends and we're so deeply appreciative to them. Tonight's sponsors are dear friends, Teddy and Warren Struhl. Teddy and Warren are serial entrepreneurs. Warren actually wrote a book about that. You may benefit from some of their products and their latest uh, is an amazing company, which long before they sponsored, I have been a customer of and no pull in favors, no discount code. I would literally just use this company because I love how good it is. And the company is, my photo, myphoto.com, the brainchild of Teddy and Warren. Of course, our dear friend Dove Quint, a major part of its great success. Um, my photo, why does it work? Why is it great? Go on your phone. Everybody's phone is filled with not tens or hundreds, but literally thousands of pictures. And you went on vacation or you have your quarantine pictures or there was an event that you wanted to capture and you want to have in perpetuity. And then what happens with it? It sits on your sits phone. It sits on your phone. You know what happened before that? If it weren't complicated, I'd actually turn the camera to the closet here in my study. <laughs> Do you know what I have in the corner of my closet? I have a stack of every old home computer we've ever had. <laughs> you have that? You, guys you don't have, have slides? You don't have slides, Rabbi? Okay. Uh, relax yourself. Rabbi. <laughs> relax yourself. No one said permanent panelists, so relax yourself. Listen, I have in the corner Next of my closet. Next to record player. I got, I got a pile. You don't have that, Rabbi Brody? A Not anymore. I, three months ago, I did. 
I got all my home computers. Why? Because every one of them has different files, pictures, videos that are on there. And there's this enormous fear. I can't throw it out. What if I'm going to lose something? So we have home computers, laptops, I, we have cloud storage, pictures. They just sit there instead of adorning our home, our office, instead of being able to see them. My photo is the answer. It's amazing. You email your picture to one, two, three at myphoto.com. And you get an email back right away with your picture in all these different options of how to buy it. You, you go, you press a link, you buy it. It's delivered a package. I'm not, I'm not just saying this because they're a sponsor of our good friends. I've told them privately what I'm telling you now on air. I've never had a more seamless transaction arrive more timely in better packaging. It's really fantastic. So they sent each of us a picture for tonight to celebrate their sponsorship of my photo. Huge thanks to Ted, Warren, Dove, the whole team over there. So what picture did you send them? What do you get? What do you have? I sent two. Oh. Or well, Moskowitz, tell us about tell us about your picture. First of all, we only got one, but okay. <laughs> well, I'm from Boston. Warren. I'm I'm indecisive. Um, so I have one full family picture, which uh, we took. I think it was before Pesach this year, and obviously that's near and dear to me. And the other one is a picture of my children, which was taken pre Hanukkah this year. And uh, there was actually an issue with the first one, which is why they printed the second. And then I was able to fix the first one. So I'm the beneficiary. Oh, what's that? What's that? What's that? So you're that guy who goes to the restaurant yeah. and you're like, this the sushi roll. I said brown rice. I said, oh, I was so sorry, sir. We'll bring you brown rice. And then they go to take away the white rice. And you're like, just leave that one too. That's good. No, 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 no. First of all, I'm that the guy? Are you that guy? No, 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 no. Not at all. Guy? I'm actually the, I'm the opposite. I am the opposite. I am the nicest guy in the restaurants. I have such rachmanas. Those guys are running around. No, no, no. I'm the nicest person in the restaurant. I would never do that. But, why'd you um, choose? Why'd you choose those pictures? What's more important to me than family? I know Rabbi Brody <laughs> chose a different kind of picture. <laughs> I but, didn't choose uh, Rabbi Brody. <laughs> Rabbi Brody, what did you choose? Show us the picture that you had them do for you. First of all, let me just tell you about this. My photo. I told my mom about it, and she's like, "Listen, I can't figure this out. This is going on the computers and going and trying to upload. I don't know what upload means." Yeah, let me tell you. She went ahead. She did this, and in two seconds, she uploaded everything. One, two, three. She got a beautiful framed photo delivered they oh, deliver right. it right from del rey you have it literally in a few days it's never been the problem, problem, but i'll tell you the, figure out i'll tell you the problem with the sponsorship is they ruined my idea for ariel's birthday gift mm. i'm out now all right brody show us your rabbi brody show us your picture okay so i didn't pick the picture Unlike Phil, who takes 14 different pictures and says, oh, I don't want that one. <laughs> Brown rice, white rice, uh, <laughs> Brown raw, rice. rare, well done. I'm just saying, I have two of them now, guys. I got two. So I just got I know, this in the mail I know today. A guy, hold on, hold on. Let me just tell you, I know a guy, his shtick. I'm not saying this is ethical or right. I'm just telling you it's a shtick. He gets a steak. And if you eat a lot of the fries and you tell them something wrong with steak, please cook it more. They'll never give you back the plate just with the steak. They refill the fries. Nah, that's stealing. Mm -hmm. That's wrong. It's a wrong move. But, you know, it's the same thing as like two pictures. There's a problem with my first picture. Yeah. So what picture did you go with, Rabbi Brody? So I didn't send them anything. I just got a great picture from Warren. It's actually a picture with me and John Struhl. This goes back about 10 years. They sent this to me. This is a photo. This is a. First of all, is that third guy in normal, the, th the third guy's in normal height? He's like 5'8". Listen, eight. <laughs> listen eh, everyone knows I'm in the world of outreach. And there's no Jew out there that I won't try and conquer. And then there was, you know, there's one guy up in New York. He's probably one of the most famous uh, DJs in the world. And uh, we gave it a shot. We're still working on it. How'd it go? Listen, biggest supporter of Israel. All right. Who, Who's a great can't see day. That picture. Great All right, day. you're keeping the picture down. All right, it's nice. Tall, tall gentleman with long hair. Um, I got my picture. Rabbi. Beautiful packaging. And I sent them uh, this picture just uh, right away from the uh, engagement. Got my whole family, my new family Beautiful. all together. So very excited. You only about got it. one picture. I got only one picture because I keep it simple. But listen, I don't want to take advantage of our of our good friends. But um, we have to move on past the sponsorship. But I just want to say this because this is for our audience, not the sponsors. Like previous sponsors, they've stepped up and they're offering something incredible. So go on myphoto.com and put in the code BIMA B I M A for a limited time, twenty five percent off your order. Uh, maybe you didn't hear me. One quarter off your order, 25%. Go on, order things for your walls, pictures, desk, keychain. You can order all kinds of things, pictures in every which way. And I'm, again, not for the sponsors. I'm saying this for you. Go on. Dove Quince just joined the program. Warren's watching. You, Ted's probably you can sleep. Take a picture past bedtime. Of this, take a picture of this right now of us. And yeah, you can take have this frame, a picture of acrylic. us. You can have this framed. Rabbi Brody will sign it for you. Anyway, 25% off. 
25% off B-I-M-A. Put Bima in the checkout and you'll get for a limited time 25% off. But it gets even better than even that. Even better. That's not enough, Rabbi. Not enough. It's not enough. What else are we going to do for our audience tonight? Listen, if they go and share this show between tonight and next week, we're going to do the biggest raffle. Where we're going to give away, you'd say $100 would be huge. 200 No, $500. No worth. way. $500. You say, what do I get for five? That must be huge. Listen to this. Three foot by four foot acrylic, huge photo. And you say, well, what, I, I would like a photo. What kind of photo? That's we're gonna life do a size drive of Rabbi Brody. Shoot. We're going to go and we're going to do one of these things where one of our photographers is going to take a picture of you and your family. You stay in your driveway. They'll take the photo. Or if you live up in New York and you're sharing it, no problem. Send them in one of your family portraits and they will send you a $500 frame photo. Now, let me ask you this. First of all, one of, our, one of our listeners is telling us we're spending too much time, but we're not spending time on the sponsor right now. We're spending time on the audience. Ask the woman who, who got a $500 gift certificate to Jayfetter Jewelers whether we spent too much time. Exactly. Share the, sh share the show. You get this thing worth a value of $500. Question Rabbi Brody is, does my photo have the expertise to, to get rid of the shine? Can, can they wipe out the glare? <laughs> I'm actually using right now, it's called the Shabbos light. I just found <laughs> out they have three settings. I don't know if you knew this. I've been using the, the lowest setting and even on the lowest setting, look at this. Look at that. I'm still glowing on top. <laughs> it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Oh, you know who's watching? Any, any you know who no just problem. joined? You want to get Matthew Hockerman. Matthew Hockerman's on board, but so is my cousin, the esteemed, the great, the one and only Rabbi David Beshefkin. Rabbi Beshefkin, we'll get you on one day as a guest, but let me give you a message for now from some of your biggest fans on Hollyhock Trail and Boca Raton. They miss your top five from Mishpacha Magazine. I'm sure you're busy. There's a lot going on. But frankly, you got to put the you got to put the audience first. It's time for a top five. I haven't seen Mishpacha this week. Maybe the Shavuos edition has one, but we'd love to uh, we'd love to have those top five back. You clearly got all the comedy in the family. I did not. I just got the good looks. But um, thanks for all that. So Rav David, it's good to see you. It's good to have you. So let's move on, gentlemen. We're going to be joined by our special guest soon. Uh, our special guest are by Shai Shechter. We'll give an introduction to him when he arrives. He's uh, really fantastic. Share our show. Be entered into that raffle. Don't forget. Share it now. Between now and next week, be entered into that raffle. Myphoto.com. So what was it like? We resumed davening yesterday. Monday, we were supposed to be back. We put in a lot of time. Captains, cones, spacing, masks, registration, security, parking decals. Unbelievable amount. When I was in rabbinical school, I never thought I'd be the event planner. This. They didn't teach us to be working on how to orchestrate and organize all that. We were supposed to be back Monday, but Hashem, the Almighty, had different plans. He determined that Monday was not the day to rent down for the entire day. We came back together yesterday morning. What was that like? It was, uh, first of all, very hot, very emotional. You put a post on Facebook that went viral. Um, I will say it has been a very long time since I've cried for a Baruch Hu on a Tuesday morning. But I was crying like a baby. It was very emotional feel the power of a tzibor for the first time in, in 240 minyan and whatever the case might be. Um, it was also very hot. I'm not going to lie. Florida in the summer outside was, uh, was a little bit difficult. But I found it, as you said, you put it well. It's like an ila. It was really powerful, really nice to see people again. So proud of our community. Everyone who came followed the rules diligently. They did exactly what they were asked to do. They came onto the campus. We davened. Everyone wore masks, social distancing, eight, eight feet apart. And then after Minyan, everyone kind of gave each other yeshkoach and got back in their right. cars. It was a really yep. beautiful experience. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I had the same feeling, palpable, really like brought to tears, answering Yehesh Rabba. 242 straight davening that we missed it. 242 is a big number. I mean, in your adult life, have you gone 10 Minions in a row that you didn't go to Minion? Maybe you had the flu. Maybe you were knocked out. Well, that's an unfair you, question. Yeah, yeah. The end. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was asked. Yeah, you were, time. I, that's actually Yeah, unfair. the answer that's is yes. But, but, I, but I will yeah. say this, um, I, I miss Shul and I've been reading your blogs, Rabbi Goldberg, which have been phenomenal. And I, I miss the Shul and I miss the Tzibor. Um, but I will say that as much as I'm happy to get back to Tefillah B'Tzibor, there was something really special about davening with my children every day, three times a day mm. that I'm gonna miss enormously. Um, I, didn't, I don't think I appreciate it. And again, this is not a rabbi thing. This is someone who takes men seriously. So much of my children's relationship with davening was me running out the door, right? Daddy's running out of the house in the morning for shachars. He's running out from in Hamar if he's running, right? And all of a sudden now, davening was this beautiful thing that was like a family experience together. And there's a part of me that's really going to miss that. And I'm really having a difficult time acclimating to the, to the change in that. I don't know if you feel that as well. 
Do you think the heat and humidity is part of the problem of acclimating or it's uh, if you were comfortable indoors air condition? No, I think it's, I think there's something about having your, your, your son next to you. There's something about, um, you know, not running out, being able to, I I just, I found it a really Beautiful. beautiful experience to include my family in it. Beautiful. We're going to come back to that, but we've been joined by our special guest, Rabbi Shai Shechter Shlita. Rabbi Shechter, thank you so much for giving of your time and to be with us this evening. we got a wonderful audience on multiple platforms, including many clearly fans of yours who joined us just in time to hear you. So I want to thank you for giving your time. I'm here with Rabbi Phil Moskowitz, Rabbi Josh Brody. Thank you for joining us. Hello, Rabbi Moskowitz, Rabbi Brody, and certainly a warm, warm hello to Rabbi Goldberg. It's so nice to finally see you after all these times that we've been texting and emailing. Absolutely. Having me. Let me give a word of introduction to someone who needs no introduction, but Rabbi Shai Shechter currently serves as the Rosh Beis Medrash at the Young Israel of Woodmere. That really um, undersells his position. He is a, uh, a formidable force who is teaching and sought after and listened to and learned with from people around the world and who sought after around the world. Um, a leader, a dynamic personality, a big time machacham and a wonderful Torah teacher. And it's for that reason that you're here as a guest tonight. Um, and also because we, we're hopeful that you can give us some insight. I think something on a lot of people's minds. Um, your father, Mori Varebi Harav Herschel Shechter Shlita, uh, one of, we believe, the Gedola Yisrael of our time, has, has really distinguished himself in this difficult crisis and time period of putting Klai Yisrael on his back, on his shoulders. And you've had a front row seat. More than that, you've really been an assistant to help Rebbe in terms of uh, juggling, writing the tshuvas, translating, disseminating, and uh, without trying to put you on the spot, but both from your perspective as a rabbinic leader and the community you're involved in leading, and with a front row seat, we're jumping right into it, Rabbi Shechter. I hope you forgive me for that. With a front row seat as to what, what the Rebbe is going through. You know, Rav Shechter, everybody knows that, that Rav Shechter Shlita is a huge Tamachach. I'm a Rosh Hashiva, Yeshiva University, Rosh Kolo, is the width and breadth of Torah at his fingertips. What they don't necessarily know is that every Shaila he's asked often move him to tears. The seriousness with which he weighs and takes every person's individual tzara, their, their crisis. So how has this been weighing on him? How have you been uh, balancing that, helping protect him from everything and yet harness his greatness for the klal? So these are really uh, loaded questions. I was told we only have 15 minutes. I really just tried to think in the last few hours about some of the highlights that we can share, just to give people a little bit of an insight and a perspective into what's been going on on, uh, on this side of things. So as you know, um, there were over the last three months, I would say hundreds, if not thousands of questions of inquiries, and they were really of critical and urgent nature. And really hundreds of emails a day, hundreds of calls a day. My father's turning 80 this summer. He's not a young man. Wow. He, wow. He, he acts young and he, and he has tremendous energy and it amazes all of us. But I have to tell you that there were emails coming in from chief rabbis of so many different countries, from hospital administrators, both Jewish and non-Jewish alike, from medical ethicists also, some of them Jewish, some of them were not, uh, heads of COVID ICU units here in New York and Boston and Florida, calling from all over the place, Shul Rabbanim, family members, infectious disease specialists, just a whole the whole gamut. They were calling sometimes together, sometimes separately, and what they needed was prompt and immediate responses. And what I found absolutely amazing, and I guess most humbling, was the fact that for every single one of these questions, and let's just remember, these are questions that you can't look in a tshuva safer to find the answers for, because these are questions that are unprecedented. These are, many of them have to do with the circumstance that we have now, which really, even though there were epidemics in previous periods in Jewish history, but they were not of the magnitude or of the complicated nature of the Jewish communities that we have today. And what I found most amazing was that for every single one, my father had a completely calculated, formulated, and developed response for every single one. Like there was an approach for everything. And I finally asked him, when did you prepare all of this? I I don't understand. When, when did you develop all of these formulations in your head? People were calling about sharing ventilators and about everything under the sun that really nobody has ever thought of. And I couldn't understand. In fact, um, one of my other fathers in life is, is Hagon or Bashar Weiss, who to me is like a father and to many others as well. And he would call me every day or two and ask, what's going on in New York? Obviously, things weren't as serious in Eretz Yisrael. And he very much wanted to be in the know of what was happening, what Shilas we were working on. He was astounded 
about the severity of the Shilas that were going on here and the intensity of all the issues. And my father finally told me that I've been preparing for 80 years. Wow. And wow. that to me was so powerful. It was something that a Gadol Israel develops over decades, develops over years. This is not something that you just look up and try to figure out the answer to like we normally do with a Shiloh. This is something that takes an entire lifetime to figure out. And, you know, you mentioned before, I don't know if this is supposed to be question and answer or I'm just supposed to go unhinged. I don't no, know we'll, we'll, in, we'll interrupt it. you when we're ready. Okay. Don't worry. So wherever you want. But you mentioned before about um, my father's sympathetic nature. And one story really resonates from the last couple of months now that you mention it. And that was, there was the head of a very prominent COVID ICU here in New York, who I'm in very regular contact with. We were friends before COVID happened. And this, uh, this doctor, who's a real medical professional and was really, had not gone home for a few weeks in a row. The hospital actually took out a hotel room two blocks away and this doctor stayed in the hotel so she wouldn't go home oh. weeks at a time. Hundreds of people were dying every day and it was just very difficult. And she called me one day with a very serious life and death Shiloh that she was faced with. Happened to be it was a non-Jewish COVID ICU patient and she was very troubled about how she was going to handle it. And I said, look, this is way above my, my understanding, way above my pay grade. We conferenced in my father and he was listening to the Shiloh and all of a sudden there was silence on the other line. And the doctor starts saying, hello, hello, Rav Schefter, are you still there? Did we get cut off? And I had to text her uh, offline and say, give him a minute, he's actually crying from your Shiloh. Wow. And she was so amazed. And, and when you think about it, after going through so many heart-wrenching Shilas, literally hundreds of them a day, for weeks at a time, and each one of them was an emotional roller coaster to think about and to consider the distress of each family and each patient just tormenting. And yet, every single time to cry about it and to be so sympathetic and so sensitive, and just it showed such a humanity. It's not just about the halacha, it's not just about the cut and dry, what the psak is. It's about understanding people and it's about the shared humanity that we all have and the difficult times that all of us we're enduring and continue to endure. And that to me was really a tremendously inspiring perspective. I'll tell you a story that, that matches that story that really complements it. Um, and first of all, people should know that uh, Rav Shai and I are, are close friends. You know, until recently, I thought that we were a similar age. I, I fooled myself, but uh, his parents celebrated a significant milestone a few years ago. And uh, Rav Shai Shechter dug up a picture of a Purim Chagiga at YU, where he was a young child on my shoulders while I was in YU in Rav Shechter's shir. So that uh, <laughs> contrast put everything in perspective and made me feel very old. But it's a compliment to Rav Shai, uh, just how uh, advanced he is in his learning and his leadership that we consider him we consider him a peer. So several years ago here in South Florida, we faced hurricanes, unfortunately fortunately, on a semi-regular basis. And we were confronting a hurricane heading right towards us. And there was an extraordinary amount of complicated Shilas. And I called Rebbe, I called your father. And the similar circumstance, he paused, he was crying. And not only did he answer the questions, but he was very concerned with our well-being and what would be. And, and to have not only the brilliance and that encyclopedic mind, but to have that compassionate and that feeling heart and the combination of the two are really what are the makings of, of a gadol. So, so let me just tell you, the one Shiloh that my father was completely stumped on, which amazed me, was uh, really everything else he had a calculated formulation for. I got an email one day from the chief rabbi of Rome, and he wrote to me a Shiloh that there were many women who have uh, nail extensions. And because all the nail salons were closed for weeks at a time, they were unable to have the extensions taken off professionally. Now, he claims that if you try to take it off on your own at home without a professional, it looks even worse. So every right. Jewish and non-Jewish women alike were leaving their nails and uh, assuming that at some point they would take care of it, even though it didn't look so appealing. And he called, he wanted to know, is that a chatzitza for going to the mikveh? Because normally we would insist that a woman take off such nails, but because under the circumstances, the non-Jewish women in Italy were doing the same, he wondered whether or not that would be a chatzitza. I called my father, I asked him what he thought, and he said, wow, that's, that's an amazing shayla. <laughs> You're figuring out life and death questions all day long. You're figuring out how to share ventilators and all of this, and now you get on a chatzitza shayla? So uh, actually, in the end, Rav Asher Weiss picked that one up. He was really excited about it. 
and he ended up writing a tshuva because of that Shiloh that came in. I don't know if you have the booklet that came out, but it uh, right. is featured in there. Amazing. Uh, it's and, to, and to witness the, the respect between Rav Asher Weiss and, and your father is something very special to see. Also, I want to give the other rabbis a chance to ask you a question, but I'm going to ask you a question that hopefully doesn't cost me our friendship, putting you on the spot this way. When you grow up in such a home, exposed to, connected with the son of such a gadol, with such brilliance, such excellence, such humility, because that's the other part people don't appreciate. Rav Schechter has no idea we're talking about him right now, wouldn't want us to be talking about him right now. He doesn't know how to connect a computer. He doesn't know how to check how many followers or how many people tuned into Shiurim. He's Kula Torah. That's his only interest, is learning Torah, living Torah. How does one grow up in such a home without feeling an enormous pressure? How does one try to have drive to achieve in Torah themselves, uh, knowing that it will be difficult, not to suggest that you can't measure up, Rav Shai, but that it will be difficult to measure up to, to someone someone so close to? <laughs> there goes your friendship. <laughs> uh, it's, no, it's okay. It's a very good question. Um, it's something that I remember growing up, I mentioned to my father on numerous occasions when I was in high school, when I was in yeshiva, you know, it's very difficult to be your son. And he just totally didn't understand it. He really didn't, like, why would it be difficult to be my son? And he saw himself as the same as everybody else in my life. He didn't see why he was so extraordinary and unusual. But I do remember a, uh, a number of things that really made an impression on me. One was my father told us many, many times that the Gemara says in Sanhedrin that when a king takes on the mantle of leadership, it's mitzvah sheyichtav lo sefer Torah. The Torah says he has to write a sefer Torah, but karabo kol yemei chayav. He has to read in that sefer Torah every day of his life. That is supposed to be the guiding focus, the guiding light of every decision that he's going to make. And the Gemara says, what if his father was a king and his father passes away and now he takes over the mantle of leadership as a son, as a prince? Does he have to commission the writing of a new sefer Torah or can he use the one that was written by his father? And the Gemara says, no. Mitzvah lo sheyichtav mishalo. As children, my father always told us, without making any allusion to himself, he told us this Gemara, and he said, every son of a melech has an obligation to write his own Sefer Torah. And I didn't appreciate what he said until I got much older, when I understood that what he meant was that we all have an obligation, even though our father has a tremendous legacy and represents a tremendous Sefer Torah on his own, each one of us have an obligation, mitzvah sheyichtav lo mishalo. So that's thought number one. Thought number two that comes to mind, if I may, is do you remember Rabbi Goldberg, my grandfather, Rabbi Melech I, I was in his shir. I learned Tachos Nida with him. So he was just one of the sweetest, most sincere Jews out there. Just an amazing person. So many times at our family simchas, he would relay the following story. And he said when he was growing up, when he was raising his son, my father in the Bronx, he said he was a poor rabbi of a small shul. He didn't have any money. So when it came to my father's bar mitzvah, they made a small kiddush with kichel and herring after davening. That was the whole bar mitzvah. And he said there was a conservative rabbi who was the rabbi of the shul a few blocks away, and he saw a crowd of people standing outside, and he asked them what's going on. And they said, well, Reb Melech Shechter is making a bar mitzvah for his son Herschel. So he said, oh, I'm friendly with Reb Melech. So he went in to wish mazel tov. And he gave my grandfather a bracha, which my grandfather used to repeat at every one of our family simchas. And he said that, I hope someday in the future, Herschel won't be known as Rav Melech's son. I hope you'll be known as Rav Herschel's father. Oh. That was the brach of the conservative rabbi by my father's bar mitzvah. And my grandfather used to tell us, he said, you guys don't understand. Your father is a walking Sefer Torah. And although I was a pretty famous person, he told us, he was in charge of doing all the Gitten and Chalitza for the RCA in New York. He was pretty prominent on his own. He was a great Talmud Chacham, a rabbi. And he said, it was not long before nobody remembered who I was. And I became known as Rav Herschel's father. And he said, there was nothing that gave me more pride. And the bracha he gave all of us was, I hope there will come a time when they'll forget me and they'll forget your father. And they'll only think about the grandchildren and they'll refer to all of us as the grandparents and the parents of all of you. And that to us was always very encouraging, very inspiring. Beautiful. That's an amazing Can I, can I follow up on that? Because one of the questions, I, I was going to ask a similar question, but, you know, our, our fathers weren't rabbis, right? Our fathers were, were in other, other uh, you know, they, they did other things, let's just say. Um, growing up at, in the home with one of the, the, the biggest gadol, in, 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 in America, was there ever a point where you said, I don't want to do that? I just don't want to be a rabbi. It's too much pressure. 
I'm going to go into some other line of work. Uh, personally, yeah, this is what I always wanted to do. I was proud of what my father did and represented. I uh, never had any negative feelings about it. Again, there were certain challenges. My parents used to travel a lot and still travel a lot. Um, we were expected to be responsible adults at probably two years old in our house because, uh, you know, there just wasn't an opportunity for us to be uh, looked after the way most two or three year olds are looked after. And my parents expected that we were going to be independent. And if you know any of the other members of my family, each child is extremely independent, which my parents are very proud of. My parents are very proud that each one went in their own path and each one is independent, made their own choices. And we all get along beautifully and we're all very close. We're not all in the line of Avodah HaKodesh. We are all doing uh, great things, but everybody's doing their own thing and we're all extremely close. And that to me is a, is a sign that my parents really gave us that feeling of individuality and gave us that freedom. That's great. Um, from, First of all, Rav Shai, most... unlike, unlike uh, R- Rabbi Goldberg, I was never privileged to be in your father's shear, but I, I, I learned... Yeah. Never too I learned, late. not yet, not yet. I mean, I've, I've heard many share him from him, but uh, I learned as much from watching him. I remember one of the most powerful Yom Kippers I ever had in my life was in the YU based measures. They put me in the front row right in front of your father. And uh, watching your father, Davin, throughout Yom Kippur was an experience I'll never forget. And the other one is with Rabbi Goldberg. I don't know if you remember, it was in Congressman Ted Deutsch's office yep. on the fly into, I think you were there, Shai, Rav Shat Rabbi Schechter. And um, your father made a bracha achrona. I think he was eating grapes. And he made a bracha achrona, and it was the most powerful bracha achrona I've ever heard in my life. And so people talk about the Talmudic knowledge, and you spoke about the empathy, but it's the Yiri Shemayim that permeates everything that he does that, uh, that, that has inspired me throughout the years. But I want to shift a little bit, because you're wearing two hats tonight. One is obviously uh, the son of uh, the God of Lador, but the other is your Rosh Beis Medrash of a very prominent shul in, in Woodmere. And so my question is, you have a lot of people on this call and on the Zoom and on Facebook Live that are going to be having a very different Shavuos this year. They're not going to be in a standard, you know, shul environment where they have shirim all night and the coffee to keep them going. A lot of them don't have the skill set necessarily on their own to be able to learn. What advice would you give to someone who's experiencing Shavuos um, in a different way this year? who wants to tap into the magic of Talmud Torah, but might not necessarily feel the confidence and the skill set. Um, what, what advice would you give them to, to inspire them, to, to make the most of this year Shavuos, despite the fact that it's going to be different than any other Shavuos they've ever felt? So I think the best thing I can say is that I am just as challenged as anyone else's. I am nervous about what my Chag HaShavuos is going to feel like and look like. And uh, I can't say there's an easy answer. One thing that I think is important, probably to me the most inspiring story from the last few months, and there were so many things that were extremely inspirational, but something that to me was so powerful was as a, uh, as a good child, I try to call my parents you know, once a day just to check up what's doing and make sure they're feeling well. And um, I certainly called my parents after Shabbos every week the last couple of months to make sure that they were, uh, that they had a nice Shabbos. It's a little lonely. My mother actually told me that, you know, it was so lonely in the house when they set up Friday night, they put out six uh, plates, two for Friday night, two for Shabbos day, and two for Shalashudas. They set it up Friday night already to make it feel like they had guests. So, you know, they came up with their own gimmicks, with their own ideas, but I called on Matsai Shabbos. I couldn't get through, and I called again and again, and finally, when I got through, I said to my father, why was the phone off the hook? He said, no, I was on the other line. So I said, what was going on? So he said it was actually Reb David Cohn from Flatbush had called. So I asked my father, what did Reb David Cohn call about? Because I assumed he called because he's dealing with the same life and death issues as my father was. And they probably called to uh, compare notes or to talk about it. And my father said, no, that's not what we discussed. So I asked him, can you just tell me what was going on? So he said, yeah. He said, Reb David Cohn on Shabbos, the phones weren't ringing. Sir so David Cohn was back to his regular learning and he was studying Maseches Menachos and he had a big Chiddush in one of the sugyas that he learned. And he was upset the rest of Shabbos because he said, I have nobody to share this with. And he said, the moment after Shabbos was over, he said, I have to call my friend Reb Herschel Schefter because he's actually going to appreciate this Chiddush. He'll be able to talk and learning with me in a sugya in Menachos. And that's what he did. And he called my father up. Wow. 
and they spoke about a sugya chiddush and menachos, and my father gave some back and forth with him. And my father said, after they were done, they thanked each other and they hung up. And to me, it was so inspiring. You know, the whole world is upside down and the whole world was in such upheaval. Everybody was so disoriented and everyone was so confused, but the Torah is still there. The Torah is the constant and it was never forgotten all along the way. And that to me is the most inspiring thought of so much of this, that we have so much uncertainty in the world but if we can just think this Chag HaShavuos about how much the Torah has stood for the Jewish people and how much we have stood for it. You may not be on the level of learning to learn so much on your own. I know here in the shul, we split up all of Tanakh and everybody took one parak. It's a beautiful initiative. And that's really for people who are able to do so. Not everybody's even able to do that. But even if you cannot learn, just try to think a little bit over Chag HaShavuos about how significant Torah is to our people especially in difficult times. And that story of my father and her David Cohn was something that just really made it so real to me. It made it so alive and so inspirational because it just showed how the Torah is mesos chayenu. The Torah is what we live by. It's what we breathe. It's everything that we represent. And it's everything that represents us as well. It's a great- uh, That was amazing. Wow. The great part of that story is that that night, Rav Shai actually texted me or voice noted me on WhatsApp to share that story and to hear your excitement about that story and the inspiration that you drew. And even with your front row access and that connection, the things that still surprise or inspire you is, is really beyond beyond amazing. And to see that, and and I think, you know, your father, Gemara talks about different great rabbis who are Machayev, they obligate people because even though they had unusual circumstances, they still found a way to learn. And with everything on, on your father, on Rebbe's shoulders, if anyone had an excuse to be too tired, too exhausted, unable, but even when he's been to Boca, and he has a weekend where I won't say how many shirim he gives because I get in trouble with the family every time I do. And that's really because he doesn't want to rest. He wants to teach. And when there's a moment in between the shirim, there's not an exhale. There's not let me snack. There's give me, can I have a gemara? Where's a seat? Where's a chair? And to see that commitment, that Torah, you know, Torah is the air he breathes. It's literally his oxygen. And we live in a time where so many leaders are so calculated and it's political and what will serve their interest and what will serve their fan base and what will serve their agenda. And, and Rebbe is really just free of all of that. He doesn't know from any of those things, um, you know, not to describe him as antiquated, but Rebbe doesn't have a cell phone. When he flies to Florida on his own to give a shear, he's come given a series of shiurim and at night said, do you have a telephone? I haven't spoken to my wife all day. I'd like to call her to say hello. And it occurred to me how many times I would have texted, WhatsApp, emailed, called. He's just, he's not distracted by the trappings of this world, by an agenda, even by an awareness that other people use to calculate how popular opinion and how will it, it's just, it's MS, it's truth. And it's Torah. Most of the time it's popular. Sometimes it's even unpopular, but he's a fidelity and a loyalty to truth and Torah. And that inspires my Shavuos and I think so many others as well. So it's interesting you mentioned that because um, at one point when the Shavuos were being written over the last few weeks, the few months, I guess it is now. So there was a uh, very prominent Rosh Hashiva who called me and he was begging me, please, please do not have Rav Shechter print a Shuva about a certain issue. People are just going to be upset at it. They're going to laugh at it. Please, please, just really. And he asked me that I should uh, check it over with him before it's published. And I feel that my father's uh, integrity does not need to be compromised. I don't need to check over his workings with other people. But out of deference to this great man, I did. And I called him and he made all kinds of suggestions. I said, listen, you can call my father directly and make your suggestions before we publish it, but I'm not, I'm not getting involved. So it was back and forth, literally an entire day, back and forth. He was trying to change it. And my father finally called me and he said, this is not a popularity contest. I have been asked Shilas and I need to give answers. And if people are not going to appreciate the answers that I give, it doesn't mean that I change the answer. I have an integrity of the halachic system that I need to uphold. And this is not about how much they're going to love me for the answer I'm giving. It's Torah Samas. And that I think is, again, a point that we can all think about over, uh, over Shavuos as well, how truthful are we to the values of the Torah? And how careful are we to make sure that sometimes when it's difficult for us, and especially I can say now, I don't know in Florida what exactly is going on, but I can say right now, when every, almost every other shul around us in this vicinity in New York is already davening in Minyanim, is doing their thing, and we are being challenged as Rabbanim, to have real emunas chachamim, that we should be waiting two weeks. It's not easy. It's emotionally difficult. It's intellectually difficult. 
our balabatim are being uh, are having a very hard time accepting that, and and I I appreciate that. I'm also having a hard time. But when you think about the fact, take a step back and ask yourself, why do I want to daven with a minion? Because it's Ratzon Hashem. Well, Ratzon Hashem also is that we follow those Rabbanim that we follow for every other aspect and area of our lives. And if this is what they've told us to do, this is what we do. And all of this was done with, with such agonizing conversations last week. I mean, Rabbi Goldberg, some of them we were together on, but some of them that we were not together on, I can tell you, I was on a call with my father, Rabbi Asher Weiss and Rabbi Willig, last week. It was a Zoom call. And uh, the three gedolim were, were discussing, I was just a fly on the wall, the technician who had to put the call, the Zoom call together and make sure everybody was appropriate. So uh, there I was listening to this. And in the middle, I noticed my father was being very quiet. And he, you know, characteristically, he's always very quiet in these conversations. But I noticed that he was doing something off to the side. And I called afterward. I said, what were you doing? And he says, you know, we were dealing with such a weighty discussion. This was hours and hours of deliberation. I needed to say some uh, some to him and cry a little bit before we made the decision. And Amazing. It was just unbelievable. Wow. You know, we, People we don't appreciate. It. They get an email with the latest, you know, tshuva. Maybe they want to nitpick and they don't understand what goes in and what's behind it. Rav Shai, thank you for your time tonight. You thank are you so a much. great tribute thank and testament you. to your father. And we can't let tonight go by without mentioning also your mother, mother. wonderful personality in her own right. Your mother had one of the great lines of all time when asked what it's like to be married to a gadol hador. She famously answered, I don't know, ask my husband, which is a, <laughs> a, gr- a great story, a great story of the great Rabbitson. And uh, you're a testament. Hear one message that my father has asked me to share with people. Can I have two more minutes? Of course, please of take course. your time. So my father asked me um, to share this message because he thought it was important. I didn't tell him I was speaking on this, but over the last few weeks, I asked my father a number of times how it is that he remained calm and composed throughout this whole process. There was so much pressure and so so much tense conversations and so many intense discussions that were going on. And I asked him, how do you remain calm and collected throughout all of this? And he really, in case you don't know him, he, he, some of the listeners, he never raises his voice, never gets frazzled. He just takes everything in stride like another day in the office. You know, it's just, it's an, it's amazing. And I asked him and he told me over a vart in the name of the Baal Shem Tov. And with this really, I'm going to close because uh, I feel bad. It seems you have another guest you need to get to. So I want No, no, you're the, you're the only guest. You take your time. Okay. <laughs> so, we feel bad abusing your time. That's all. You know, I'm digressing for a second on that story, but you know, before the Siyam Ashas, my father was called by the Aguda and he was asked to take a video for uh, to be shown at the Siyam Ashas. And my father in his humility, when the man called him up and said, I'd like to schedule a time to come video you, my father said, you know, I'm not such a great speaker. I'm not sure you really want me speaking. So he said, no, 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 we're going to come video you. I'm sure it's fine. You know, we want Rav Schefter on the video. So my father said, okay, I assume you're going to video a bunch of people. Whoever comes out best, that's who you'll show. And uh, a <laughs> videographer was arguing with him and he said, no, 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 you don't understand. We need Rav Schefter on the video. We don't <laughs> people. It was interesting. Right. But anyway, so I asked my father, how do you stay so calm and composed about all this? And my father told me the following verse. In Shulchan Aruch, we start off by saying, Shivisi Hashem Lenegdi Samit, which simply means that we all have to think about the fact that God is a tremendous force and presence in all of our lives. And that's the way we have to lead our lives in, in every practical way. But my father said that what's always guided him was the insight of the Baal Shem Tov, where he says that Shivisi is also Milashan Hishtavus. Hishtavus means a person who is tempered, who is moderated, always just in a moderate frame of mind. And the Baal Shem Tov put the comma there, and he said, Shivisi, the reason why I'm able to be composed and tempered at all times is because Hashem Lenegdi Samin. Because I know I wow. was always there, therefore I don't get hysterical, I don't get agitated, I'm not frenzied with everything that's going on, I don't get frantic, because Hashem is always Lenegdi Samin. And my father told me that that's what's guided him throughout many of the difficulties in his own life, but specifically in these times now, that really has been able to keep him calm and collected because otherwise it's very easy to get distracted and disoriented from all that's going on. So to me, that was a very instructive comment, but also wow. that I think was very inspirational. I hope it's hopeful for those who are listening as well, that we should always have that sense of hishtabus, that sense of shivisi, because we know that Hashem is lenegdi samid. That's an amazing word. Thank you so much. I'll tell you, uh, you know, we, um, many of Rebbe's Talmidim, who wanted to express appreciation for 
uh, his leadership and his and his broad shoulders and his psaki in this difficult time, thought, what could we do? Buy him a gift? He doesn't care about material things. What what could we possibly do? So one of our colleagues, Rabbi Dr. David Shabte, had the idea, deserves all the credit, of making a siyam on Erev Pesach. Everyone learned the edaf of Pesachim, and Rebbe made the siyam itself. And what greater way to say thank you to him than to learn? and to learn in his merit and learn in gratitude for his leadership. And I'd say the same thing to our audience tonight. If you were moved by the stories of, of Rav Shechter, senior, and uh, and his role in our life, I daven for Rebbe every day. Hashem should give him strength and good health and the ability to continue because our world in particular, and much broader than just our world, as even if they won't admit necessarily, rely and lean on his shoulders with his humility. And we are beyond blessed for that. And we need him. We, we make the Taina Tashem. Don't do it for Rav Shechter. Do it for Klai Yisrael. We need him a long time, healthy and well. And, and one of the things we can do to say thank you, particularly over this holiday of Shavuos, is take something on to learn and do it as an expression of gratitude to him. So we thank you for your time tonight. We thank you for your leadership. We thank you for helping get your father, Rebbe's Torah, out in an organized and coherent and accessible way, particularly during this time. Thank you for all that you do. Hashem should bless you too, Rav Shai, with strength and with wisdom, with nachas from your children and your family. And uh, please, God, for many years, people will say, not uh, who is Rav Shechter Sr., but that's the father of Rav Shai Shechter. <laughs> so thank you so Amen. much. Okay, wish you all thank a great yantif. Enjoy. A good yantif, a good yantif. If you're able to get your mom to share the show, she could win $500 gift certificate for the <laughs> my photo. <laughs> do anything to be on here, trust me. Yeah, we should get Rav Shechter. We should be right. on. Next, next no, year's Mother's call, Day. Just call the, the raffle. We're going to get yummy Rebitson. We've got a whole, a whole Schechter family. Uh, you know, if you want to make this really interesting, we can have, you know, a few perspectives from the Schechter children. That, <laughs> that would be interesting. <laughs> thank you so much. Have a great Yantif. All right. Thank you. Wow. That All was right, amazing. That was First of all, I got a, a flurry of texts. No, no. I got a flurry of texts after the story told about Rav David Cohn and his father after Shabbos. Yep. First, of yep. people saying, Dayenu, it was worth the whole show <laughs> for that story. First of all, I didn't want to interrupt fun. him, Phil. But what he didn't know is that I got a message on my machine after Shabbos from Rav David Cohen. He apparently could, couldn't get hold of me, so he called Rav Schechter. <laughs> I was going to talk in Menachas. I believe that. I want you to know, Rabbi Brody, that's believable about you. That was, that was tremendous. That was phenomenal. Rav Shai is very, um, he's very real and tells it like it is. And I'll tell you, you, you know what I enjoy with the relationship with Rav Shai also? is parents have nachas from children, but when you see a child who has such nachas and feels so proud to be connected to his father and mother, that's also really, really special. So we're grateful to him to have joined us tonight. Any other thoughts, reflections on that conversation? Yeah, what I loved about it is, um, and you and I speak about this all the time, there are parts of Shechter that I will never be able to emulate. I, he has an encyclopedic mind. His access to tap into Torah knowledge is something that Hashem did not gift me. Baruch Hashem, I have amazing gifts. That's not one of them. But when we speak about humility and we speak about empathy, those are things that, that I can connect to. And I love hearing those stories because it shows that Gedolim aren't just in an ivory tower. They're not just someone who's inaccessible, but they have attributes that you and I, even on, I should say that I, even on my level, am able to emulate and to tap into and to try to be a little bit more like. So I, that's why, you know, what people think about Rav Schechter, and I know you wrote a similar thing by Rav Aaron Lichtenstein. Um, it's sometimes hard to relate to Gedolim. So when we find parts of Gedolim that we can inculcate into our, Avodah Hashem, I find that very inspirational. Do you know, I once, I once, um, Rav Shechter once came to South Florida, and I don't remember if I picked him up, or when he got to my home, I said, Rebbe, how was the flight? So he said, and again, you have to know Rav Shechter to know that he didn't say this so that it would be written in a biography one day, or for me to even repeat right now. He, with complete sincerity, said, you know, the flight was amazing. He said, I sat, sat in my seat, and I opened my Gemara, and the next thing you know, they announced that everyone needs to uh, put up their tray and prepare for landing. He said, I, I didn't realize we had taken off. It was an amazing flight. And he meant that with complete sincerity. He opens Gemara and he learned from takeoff to landing. And there was no like 98 channels of direct TV and, and 40 bags of blue chips and the free Wi-Fi and, and all the th ADD that we all have when we fly. But it was, I, I have stories also, tremendous stories, but we'll leave it at that. He, he's tremendous. He's a great bracha for us and I'm grateful that we had that opportunity and we should follow up and have Yummy and, and the Rebbitson and, and some of the other uh, outstanding some members. Of the, of some of the family. Willig children on also. We could. We could make this a rabbi and rabbi's children show. Group therapy session would be really amazing. So um, uh, more topics we have for tonight. Rabbi Brody, the holiday of Shavuos, this is really a pre-Shavuos show. Again, I want to express our gratitude to our dear friends, Ted Warren Struhl, Dove Quint at myphoto.com. I'm sure you've all ordered your pictures by now. 25% off. Put Bima, B-I-M-A, Bima, as you check out, 25% off. And share our show between now and next week. 
and you have the opportunity to win a $500, like a value of $500 raffle. Really amazing. Rabbi Brody, you resumed a certain type of learning after a significant hiatus. And, and to inspire people for Shavuos, tell us about that. You have no idea. Let me let I'm me let me set it up this way. We published in our weekly last week. Oh, a quick shameless plug because I don't know any other community. This is our 24 page weekly delivered to everybody on Montoya Circles Home, filled with articles, special interest, features, interviews. But that's not enough because over Shavuos we can't learn together. So everyone also got delivered the BRS Shavuos supplement filled with original articles, recommended reading games. But that's not enough because guess what else just came out? The third volume of Yadrim, that's right. I'm holding a hard copy. You can get the PDF online now. Thick pages. You know, Rav Gavriel Zinner, the Nite Gavriel, his article on vaccination in English, only in the third volume of Yadrim. You could get not only the third volume, all three volumes of Yadrim, which is the Torah Journal of Dr. Yisrael Belazan based Medish of BRS. Shameless plug. So we, get, we published. Get someone who can pick the next color of the next Yadrim. That'll be like the next that's raffle. That's a good raffle. That is a good idea. That is a good idea. So Rabbi Brody, in last week's weekly, we had a page that said Rabbi's Recommended Reading. It was all the rabbinic team of BRS, and it was a secular book that we are reading or have read recently, and it was a Torah book that we're reading or have read recently. And your books, first of all, you clearly don't read often because you had a Rabbi Wine book from like 1902, and your, your Torah book that Azara, you had was... He's reviewing it. Your Torah book that you had was the cover of Gemara Bab Metzia. Tell us the story. That was a Bab Metzia from when I was in Israel. And I certainly haven't opened it since. And I'll be honest, you know, Baba Mitzia, all the classic yeshivish Sadar, you know, Gemara's never really uh, did it for me. I ended up going to Near Yisrael, Rabbi Friend. We had a whole different Seder Halima, different Masechtas than what other people might be uh, traditionally learning. But I remember back in Near Jake, we were learning Baba Mitzia. What Metzia, year? What so year? Give everyone a year. What year are we talking? This is 1993. Woo. A long time ago. It was a long time ago. And over uh, the sixth uh, grade, <laughs> <laughs> over the last few weeks, we ended up putting together all the guys from that particular year when we went on our gap year program to uh, to near Yaakov. And we got back the rabbi, got Rabbi Grossman, and he's teaching us exactly where we left off. Stein Olsen. We're doing the toast. Toast. And you know what? The best part is all of us. I'm telling you guys in New York that none of us have picked up that Gemara since we're all learning it as though we are still 18 years old and that our Rebbe is still our Rebbe. Meanwhile, we're all in our 40s now. And I'll tell you the funny thing is that we still have no clue what he's talking about. <laughs> Every week we all talk about it after he gets off. We try it, Rabbi Grossman, if you're watching. We love it. <laughs> That's really, I'll tell you, it's very inspirational to me and it's a message to our audience that it's never too late. You can pick up where you left off. And it doesn't matter how long the Gemara has been closed. And it's Gemara, Chumash, and Navi, whatever it is. Open the book, pick up the, where you left off. The all-time greatest Rabbi Fran line. It's never too little. It's never too late. It's never enough. never enough. That was the all-time greatest line. That's great. So you've you've resumed. How many guys is it? It's a whole bunch of guys. And then what we do is we tape it so that if you can't make it live, then you could just watch it. And it's always the same guy. It's Robert Teichman. I love Teich. Back in the day, he was the guy asking all the questions. Today, he's the so, guy asking all the questions. <laughs> it's great. Nineteen ninety. One guy. So I will tell you one guy. I'm not going to tell you who it is. I won't say a name. So Rabbi Grossman looks at the guy and he says, so listen, new so-and-so, you get it? It's like, Rabbi, I got no clue what you're talking about. <laughs> so 27 years, you, could lead, you can close the book yeah. and 27 years later, open it up again and pick up where you left off. Love it. That's a great metaphor. Amazing. That's true for learning. Is it also true for life? Can you do that with relationships? I think guys do it all the time. Guys can. Guys can. Yeah. You, I, I could. I cannot talk to someone for twenty years, and you can pick up the phone and pick right up where you left off. Let's try it. Let's not off. speak to each other again for the next twenty years. Let's see if we can pick it up right here. <laughs> that's interesting. No, that's well. Let's speak to each other next Wednesday night at the same time, nine o'clock, and let's make sure we speak to each other before then too. What are What are your learning plans for Shavuos? Anything to tell our audience about what you can do, and. Uh, one of my daughters uh, says girls can too. She's not old enough to know. It's a different relationship. It's a, I agree with you, by the way. I see a friend that I haven't seen in years and years and years. In the old days, you went to a wedding and you'd see a friend. You hug, you talk, you laugh, you connect, you confide. And then you don't see each other for 10 years again and you pick up where you left off. And I, again, these are stereotypes, generalizations. Maybe they're inaccurate. But a lot of times the woman will be like, how could you do that? You haven't even been in touch. How does that make sense? So, and I'm sure there are women like that and they're guys who need to talk. Let's not do unfair stereotypes. But yeah, it's like the safer. It's but I think the message is it's not too late. 
It's not too late. Maybe you think like, I haven't opened a Gemara since I was in elementary school. But this Shavuos, the rabbi is not there to bail you out. The Shavuos, there's no program, there's no theme, there's no classes. No one's there to bail no you out. No sushi bar, no barbecue. No, listen, we're not the certain neighborhoods. No excuses. <laughs> Come on. In all seriousness, in, in a day and age of art scroll, where everything is translated and you can really, they make things so accessible. There's something for everyone. Even the, the Shavuos guy that you just showed, um, there really is something for everyone, right? There's there's all English articles, there's Hebrew sources. Um, there's really no excuse not to even pick up something and at least try. I think that's unique right. to our generation. Yeah, the OU's putting out, YU's putting out. We've got a lot of access to a lot of information. But I tell you, people have to get over a hump, Rabbi Moskowitz, because if somebody sees themselves as, I'm not a learner, I'm just, I'm not that guy. I set up the kiddush, or I pour the liquid at the kiddush, or I'm the guy who does the chesed. And these are extraordinary parts of a Jewish life. They're part of the building blocks of Jewish life. But learning has to be one of them. And it doesn't matter what you learn or how often or when, but having learning as parts. How do you get over that hump that you get over that hump that says, I'm not the learner to see yourself as I, I am the learner. I can do it. So you're right. You can have, you can have, you and I were at a see him of someone this year, a dear friend who we yeah. admire, who described that he had bought a set of art scroll that was collecting dust on his shelf. And he looked at it and felt guilty all the time. Then he bought the Steinsatz English Gemara set. Someone recommended it. He's like, this is it. That's what's going to do it. And then it collected dust on his shelf all the time. And it wasn't until he was really called out and, and, and really felt that, that fire. And he's now making see him on, on, on the sectors. So you and I, so you and I have seen a lot of that. Baruch Hashem, last year we had a fly into New York. We we crisscrossed the New York area, the tri-state area for two days, met with Gedolim. And, and you and I saw guys who had, who hadn't picked up Svarm in a long time, who didn't really have a background, who are on fire now, who are learning consistently every single day. I think that's the key. I I, I happen to have written an article about motivation this week, but but I I, I think that's the key is Dibuk Haverim. Yeah, exactly. Um, I really believe it's Diva Chaverim. It's surrounding yourself with a chevra of people, with a group of people that are going to inspire you and motivate you. And every single one of those cases that you just mentioned and that you and I know about, it's surrounded by guys who are supporting right. that person. In a vacuum, it's very hard. But if you put yourself in a situation where there's positive peer pressure, where guys are cheering you on and they're texting you every day and they're saying, did you make time for learning today? And it becomes, I call it the NCSY Cola factor. Um, for, my, for me in my life, the, the, gr the greatness of NCSY Colo was when I was in high school, it made learning cool. All of a sudden, you came to Israel and Rabbi Yissi Kamenetsky made it that you were cool if you learned. And it didn't matter how much you learned that year. All you knew is that you came away with that feeling of I can learn and I could also be cool and I can be in high school. And I think it's the same thing for older guys. They need a feeling amongst their friends of positive peer pressure, this positive energy and encouragement. Every case that you just mentioned, that was the circumstance. I agree. I think that the accountability factor, if you have a chavrusa, they're waiting for you. If you're part of a system that you're learning something, like Rabbi Brody saying, this near, Israel, near Jake reunion. So if you're not on that call or you didn't check in, now you've regrouped where, where someone's saying, hey, Rabbi Brody or Brody or whatever they call you there. Why didn't you, uh, why didn't you check in? So the accountability factor, I'll tell you, you know, for me, it's one of the driving factors of the Daf Yomi. And it could be Nach Yomi you take on, could be Mishnah Buri Yomi, could be Daf Yomi whatever you take on, but there becomes a daily responsibility and obligation. And, and then you, you don't want to sell yourself short. You don't want to stop. So even when you hit a bump in the road or you hit a wall and you're like, I'm just not interested. I just don't want to. You can't go to sleep or you can't wake up the next day without doing it because it's part of the commitment that you made to yourself and to others. It's a big part of it. So they, they say Barav Yashiv used to call his learning chovos, a chiv. And they asked him, why do you call it a chiv? Isn't learning Torah the greatest privilege? He said, no, it's a chiv. He said, I eat every day. I sleep every day. I have to drink water every day. I have to learn Talmud Torah every day. You can't. So for him, that was like kind of that motivator in his mind. It was that one word that triggered it to make it that, uh, that he wouldn't go to sleep at night without I guess that's, learning all day. That's a message for, no, it's a message for our audience. It's most a mes message for us, which is that, you know, to view Torah and Torah study as part of the air and the oxygen that we breathe. And, you know, it's not an extra thing. It's not a nice thing if we get to it. And men, women, adults, children, people with a strong background, a more limited background. But there's, like you said, the, the library that's accessible to us today is greater than ever. And, and this is not a fake background. I wish these books were being used. So feel free to come borrow from here. But uh, we, we all have that opportunity. And this is the holiday that we renew that sense of commitment. So pick up an English book, pick up, it could be, you know, character development. It could be Jewish thought and philosophy. It could be Gemara. It could be stories of Tanakh. It can be getting to know Chumash. It can be, you know, there's, there's amazing, amazing books that challenge the mind and nourish the soul. And they, they, they're an alarm clock. They wake you up. They bring you back. 
And that's what this is uh, all about this holiday. Tell you what, it's another great motivator, your children, your children. If you don't want to do it for yourself, do it for your children. Um, I had a father in the community who about a couple of years ago came to me, said, Rabbi, I need to learn how to learn Mishnayos. I said, sure, you know, Mishnayos, we could learn Gemara, Tanakh. He said, no, I need to learn Mishnayos. I said, why? He said, because my, my son's starting to learn Mishnayos and I can't learn with him. He said, I'm embarrassed. He said, he wants to go over the Mishnayos with me and I can't. He said, I need you to teach me so that I can be able to learn with my son. And a couple of years later, thank God, he's, he's really pushed himself. It's and amazing. to be able to learn with a child is, uh, is such a great gift. So our dear audience, whoops, my mic. Our dear audience, it's never too late to open that book. For the first right. time, it's never too late to reopen that book and make contact with that old friend called Torah again. You'll see it from a new perspective. It'll help you come alive. Rabbi Moskowitz, what's the brand of the shirt you're wearing right now? Uh -huh. This is actually a Charles Turwitz shirt, which was featured in Jewish Insider today. Jewish Insider had a great story. We'll end with this. I had so much, I had so much to talk about. So much to talk about. I know, but the sure. Rabbi Schechter interview was phenomenal, so it was worth no, it. No, do we make it a two-hour show? Relax, everybody. That was a joke. Totally you don't have to write in the nine. comments now. I told you, people get antsy when we hit the hour, and I say to them, nobody's forcing Just turn it off. <laughs> Go back to what you want to do. Nobody's forcing <laughs> you to stay on. Nobody's forcing you to stay on. You're quarantined. You're at home. You have nothing else to do but listen to, to three bald, entertaining rabbis. So what's the problem? And your kids are off tomorrow, so you don't have to get up early. Yeah. Anyway, but it's Arab Shabbos. We all have to get a place. Charles so, Terwitt. Charles Terwitt. How do you pronounce it? It's Terwitt. Not Terwitt? Well, at first I thought it was like Thewitt. No, but that's wrong. It's <laughs> Terwitt, I think. I thought it's like Terwitt or Terwitt. Uh, well, our fact checker will get into it. I'll tell you the, the most underrated part of their shirts is the collar stays. Collar they stays. Have the best Co collar the stays. The copper collar stays. The no copper. question. In fact, what? I was running low. I went online to get some today. Mamish this morning. Buy them individually. You might as well just buy a new shirt. <laughs> just buy a collar stainless right now. Charles, Charles I don't Tillis understand. Can we? Can I, you explain to me why we're talking about his shirt? What? I don't. I don't get it. Let me talk about a shirt. What are you wearing? Donald Trump uh, style series shirt. <laughs> I'm right surprised now? you're wearing a shirt, Rabbi Brody. Yeah. First of all, this is our first episode <laughs> nine of Behind <laughs> the Beam. That's all I'm wearing right now. <laughs> took nine episodes for Rabbi Brody to put on a button-down shirt. Finally, and uh, only because we had a Schechter. Well, on. I put a pair of pants on. I had to go to a meeting the other day. First time in three months putting a pair of pants on. That's good to know. Pretty tight. That. I'll just tell you. I got. Why go are we out. talking about shirts, yeah. Rabbi? Tell them about the article. So I'll tell, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why we're talking about shirts because every yeshiva guy knows it's like the most orthodox shirt brand there is. For a while, it was. Oh, what's the name of the other one that um, you'd buy? Paul three, Frederick. Get four, Paul, Paul Frederick. Right. The ads. I'm going to Paul Frederick. Right. No, so the Brooks the, Brothers for a while. No, 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 no. Bro fancy schmancy, fancy pants. Boston guys wear Brooks Brothers. Outlet. Give me a break. We're outlet. Bro Rabbi Brody and I are just simple New Jersey guys. See Caucus <laughs> Outlet. If they don't sell it at the Secaucus Outlet, we weren't buying it. Sims Bash. If it's not at the Sims Bash, we're not buying. I was actually once at the Sims Bash and Rav Schechter came to buy a suit. The Sims dressing room is not individual dressing rooms. So he walked in the dressing room and the dressing room cleared out in one second. Anyway. Is that also a generational thing? I've never been there. Does that still exist? Allah Vashalom, it's closed. Sai Sims. Okay. They didn't have my size. I could never go. An educated consumer is our greatest customer. So Paul Frederick had had magazines, had ads all the time. They still do. And for one time, like if you were a yeshiva guy, a base medrash guy, a, a orthodox guy, like that was your go-to shirt. You know, right? Buy four, get six free. Buy three, get two free. Buy whatever, and you. Everyone looks so fancy. You get the free monogram, your initials. Get it in script. You get it regular. You get it however you get it. Right? That was the the mon. You don't know what I'm talking about? Those Paul Frederick shirts. I have a closet full of them. They're the Korea shirt now. When I go to the hotel, they had the <laughs> monogram. Yeah, you gotta save shirts for that. They're the monogram on it. And so, uh, but since then, several years ago, Charles Tirwit came on the scene. Although we have someone, Donny Oppenheimer says it's Tirwit. There's no way. T H Y R W I T T no, no. spells. No, no, it's not how it's spelled. It's T Y R W H I T T. Is that what you said? That was close enough. There's no way. It's Tirwit. Anyway, so his the shirts are fantastic. They uh, they've got slim fit. They've got all kinds of sizes. And extra the best slim. part about it, yeah, extra, extra slim. slim. I have not yet had that opportunity. But the best part Feels is like negative slim. Let me tell you something. Since we're confessing here, this is the after show. We don't know how many people are still with us. Right. You could wear a Charles Tirwit shirt. For like three weeks straight. As no, long as, as, long no, as you don't twice, spill it, two times I'm not max. I do. I'm not saying I do. I'm just saying I. I'm, I have two sons. How now long do you wear a shirt before you? Send I'm it with your directly. daughter. That's nasty. But two you, you times max. Nah, nah. Two times as max. Long as, as as long as you don't spill on it, you and you rotate them. You don't wear two two weeks straight. 
Yeah, no, doubt. no, but Rabbi Goldberg, I'll tell I'll tell our audience. And by the way, there's still a lot of people watching. I hope my parents are not a month. I'll be in the, such the, trouble. The giveaway for Rabbi Goldberg is when he's wearing the cufflink shirt on a Thursday. No, no, not a Thursday. Never. Sunday. <laughs> Shabbos. You get one more day out of the Shabbos shirt. You know what dry cleaning is? This is there's a pandemic. We're down so, to essentials. Hold on, hold on a second. Essentials. Hold on a second. Why isn't the whole purpose of a non-iron shirt? No dry cleaning? I dry, I dry clean, I dry clean the non-iron. Wow. But, now, but that's why I get the extra few days out of it. It lasts oh, a little okay. bit longer. First of all, I want you to know something. Even with the non-iron, when the people just take it out of the dryer and hang it, you could tell the difference between a non-iron that was hung over the dryer, no comment, and a dry cleaned not iron. Let's ask. All right. We have, we have a bunch of days. people. Uh, does anyone notice a difference between mine and Rabbi Goldberg's shirt right now? That's what I want. That's what I want to know. For sure. Right, we'll do. see. For sure. They One day anyway, back, Charles Tirwitt, so the founder of Charles Tirwitt is a guy named Nicholas Wheeler. And there was an article today. It's in the chat on the Zoom, if anybody wants to see it. Somewhere all the way back up here. It's so funny. People are writing yes, no. How do they know the <laughs> difference? Yeah, they can't see. The microphone's blocking. Anyway, there's an article in Jewish Insider about how this guy founded a non-Jewish shirt company. And, you know, the Gemara says that even a Sefer Torah needs mazel. Like your, your Aron Kodesh has eight Sefer Torah, which is the Torah that always gets used. Everything always needs mazel. So this guy, Nicholas Wheeler, the founder of Charles Tirwitt, he's got the mazel that there's an entire world and network of guys who only wear white shirts, who don't like to change them often, and who need non-iron. And this guy's got the mazel that they moved over from Paul Frederick to Charles Tirwitt, and he's now a Jewish a hero. He's a fashion king in the Jewish world. And the whole article about him was fascinating. Say, so when did everyone move over? I'm still, I'm still <laughs> in Paul Frederick. Still you have Paul to wear a shirt. Frederick. I just found Paul Frederick about a year ago. It's the collar stays. I'm telling you, it's the collar stays. I got collar stays. They're right here. Those collar stays. No, Those collar they're not stays copper. Are clutch. Those collar copper. stays are clutch. They're copper. Gentlemen, what a, what a night it was. Rav Shai Schechter, incredible insights, stories behind the Bima Copper. information. Rav Schechter of David Kohn, Gedoli Yisrael, stories, deliberations, Tehillim. What a night. His message about, about Shavuos. We got the great sponsors of Ted and Warren Struhl, Dove Quint, myphoto.com. Do we, we, yeah, everyone can hold up my photo. But, um, oh, oh, oh. I need it now. I need a sponsor for That's what you get for making fun of my shirt. No, uh, so, um, my photo. For a limited time, for a limited time, go on my phone. Fo- no, that's a sign we should end. One of my kids. I actually think wife. my wife bought one for my in-laws while the show was going on. I'm one pretty of the sure pictures? that just happened. She yeah, I think I just way. got a. I think if, I just got an email. If if you haven't gone, on, if you haven't gone on myphoto.com, <laughs> she better have gotten the twenty five percent off. That's all I'm saying. Right. <laughs> Put Bima as you check out twenty five percent off. Um, is there no spending freeze in the Moscow home? Only essentials. Um, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna end the show right now. By the way, it's a three foot by four. First of all, hold on, hold on. When it comes to celebrating your parents and your in-laws, money is never an object. It's true. It's true. Three foot by four foot acrylic museum quality. You could have a miniature Rabbi Josh Brody in your house. (laughs) Amazing. What a night. We thank our sponsors. Get your 25% off. Be entered in a raffle when you share our show. Get your volume of Yadrim, volume three. We are taking suggestions for the color for volume four. Torah Journal of the Boker Aton Synagogue of the Dr. Yitzchak Belazan Beis Medrash. Very prominent, established, incredible spreader of Torah, not only in Boker Aton Synagogue. First of all, in our new volume, can I just give props? We got to maybe have him on one point. There's an article by Aryeh Leibowitz, who we know is fantastic. He has an article about a coffee drinker's guide to Shabbos. Amazing stuff. Phenomenal. Did you know... This changed my wife's light, life. Do you guys know this? Did you know the Psaka of Belsky and others? Yeah. Even when you're yeah. Flashix, you could have coffee mate and coffee. Sure. You're, you're, like a, you're like a couple months behind that one. No, no, no that's, a game, that's a game changer. That's a game that changer. A game changer. Yeah. In Happy fact, my wife, my wife got almond milk for Shavuos. I was like, what are you doing? I was like, don't you know you can go with the other stuff now? Why no, no, no. healthier or whatever? For some people that, that overcome that fear of Fleshix, it's, it's literally like a, a new therapy that came out. That PSAC was a major Shalom Bias uh, boost. Anyway, go online, print out your Shavuot supplement, Booker Tone Synagogue, read the incredible articles by Moskowitz has become a prolific writer who even flexed tonight about his article this week. But he's a prolific writer. Print out Rabbi Moskowitz's article. He'll sign it for you and, and have it sent to you in a My Photo picture frame. Share the show. Share the show. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Um, big special thank you to uh, Rav Shai for being with us. Gentlemen, thank you for being with us, Rabbi Moskowitz, Rabbi Brody, and to our esteemed audience. 
Thank you, Rabbi. Stay happy, stay healthy, stay holy. Have a wonderful Yontif. We'll see you next week.